Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to L2 Construction Series. This is day 20. Uh, we have uh, four special guests with us today to discuss about the topic, uh, how important are professional qualifications for your career in construction industry? Now, the four special guests, I'm sure a lot of you uh, would have heard about their names or uh, already know who they are. Uh, First, we have a surveyor, Dr. Nassim from New Zealand, who is a Malaysian. Like Hongkit said, he's been exported to New Zealand. We have exported a lot of talents to other jurisdictions, and Dr. Nassim is one of them. We also have surveyor Ong Hok Tik. He is the principal of uh, Entrusty. Uh, I'm sure, again, in the construction, the local in, uh, construction scene, Many would have heard about his name and his firm. He's a claim consultant. Third, we have Mr. Nick Sunderland, who is also a claim consultant, uh, who had uh, various experiences uh, in other jurisdictions and now is based in Malaysia. And lastly, we have surveyor Dr. Muhammad Esan, is from Middle East. Now, I think without further ado, let me ask each of them to briefly introduce uh, themselves to the audience. Can we start with Dr. Nassim? Dr. Nassim, over to you. Okay, hi uh, everyone, L2, Lam and Leong, and uh, my fellow panelists as well. My name is Nassim. Actually, I've got a very long name, Nashat Ali Nassim bin Amir Ali. So to match that, that's why I had to do all those qualifications that my father insisted I do, so that my name and my qualifications sort of match. That's all. I'm a quantity surveyor by background, and um, I had after QS as a as a base degree, I went on to uh, uh, work as a quantity surveyor, then uh, moved on into project management. And uh, after that, into construction contracts, consultancy, and dispute resolution, which is my main area. First 20 years of my life, I was in industry in Malaysia, in UK, and then New Zealand. And the last 10 years, I've been uh, in New Zealand as an academic at Massey University. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nassim. Severe so, Onghok Tech, uh, could you uh, do the same, you know? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Lam. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Call me HT. Many people know me in the industry is as HT. Uh, my background, uh, I've been trained as a quantity surveyor and uh, has uh, worked in the uh, quantity surveying firm and project management firm uh, in UK. And uh, after that, uh, went over to Singapore and uh, was working with a, a claims consultant, followed by uh, back in Malaysia with a contractor. the line as well, including recruitment. So uh, that's a bit of my background. Thank you, HD. Uh, over to you, Nick. Good morning, everybody. Fellow panelists, uh, Wailun and uh, Honkit. Thank you for having me back for a second time. Uh, I'm a quantity surveyor from the UK. Um, actually, when I say quantity surveyor, unlike some of the other people probably within the seminar, I'm predominantly focused around quantity surveying as a contractor. So I'm from a contracting background. Um, I did that in the UK until uh, 2002, no, sorry, 20, hold on, 2012. And then I decided to leave and go and work abroad and focus more on claims. Um, so I've worked in America, Thailand, uh, Canada, and now for the last four years, I've been working in um, Malaysia, focusing on claims. And I have my own company called Customized Construction Management Services. Thank you. How about uh, Dr. Esan? Uh, <coughs> thanks, Mr. Lam. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Esan. Uh, I am from Malaysia. I am a contracts manager at Parsons Corporation. I'm also a part-time teaching lecturer uh, at Harold Ward University, Dubai campus. Uh, I've been uh, educated at seven universities, and I've lectured, I've taught at four universities, including UCL. So my background uh, is in quantity surveying. I am involved predominantly in claims and dispute resolution uh, and also contract administration. Thank you, yeah. 
All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Ezan, and thank you uh, to all the four panelists uh, who have actually taken the time off uh, and share your views on this particular topic today. But before we go on to ask any question of you, uh, I have got a message which I would like to share with all the audience, also the panelists here. It's very heartening that we have received this message from one of our audience, and I thought that I should share it with all of you as well. Uh, because this is uh, something that is very positive and encouraging. Um, it's actually directed to the L2 construction series team and also to all the speakers to, uh, that we have uh, had uh, in the past. And also, of course, it is also relevant and directed to our four panelists today. This is what the audience uh, named by the name June. Who, uh, this is what she has written. She said, this is not a suggestion, but actually a note of appreciation to the hosts, speakers, and the team members working hard behind <clears> the scenes. <throat> it is day 19. It was yesterday. And it means all of you have worked 19, uh, 90 days consecutively to give us valuable insights on various topics related to the construction industry. And this is no easy feat. I have been joining every of your sessions since day three and look forward to more interesting sessions in the coming week. A big thumbs up to uh, for do, all those involved in the L2 construction series for your effort to share knowledge with all of us during this trying time. This is truly remarkable. Well, you look at this, uh, this message is so encouraging and we are feeling so heartening you know, to, to receive that kind of um, a message from, um, from the audience. And we will continue uh, to do our best, you know, to disseminate our knowledge and share our speakers' uh, knowledge with all of you, um, uh, audience. Now, we are going to start our Q and A. Four panelists, are you ready? There is silence, so I assume <laughs> that all are ready. <laughs> no, silence means agree. Agree, yeah. right? Acquiescence. Huh? No, the thing is that uh, when I look at the uh, the first screen, you know, I compare in uh, the qualifications uh, attained by each of you, and I use a ruler to you know measure the length of the academic qualifications that you have obtained. You know, I realize that Nick, you have the shortest. But how do you feel about that? Do you really uh, does it really bother you when you look at the screen? You know, you have a the other three panelists who have achieved so much more academically uh, than you? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, no, it doesn't bother me. Um, I believe we all create our own uh, and make our own decisions in life. Uh, some people wish to focus on academic qualifications. I personally have chosen to focus on a blend which I perceive is experience and uh, academic qualifications. Um, so it's just, I believe, a different approach between what people want to do within their life, the different career paths that they want to take, and it's each to their own. So I'm quite happy with myself. I've got 20 years experience in the industry, um, and, you know, I would put myself up against most people with um, far more letters after their alphabet because of my experience, which I believe is uh, more important. And also, it's whether you want to make more money or you want vanity. So the qualifications may give you vanity, look impressive. <laughs> you earn more money than most of the other panelists. So, you know, it depends what, what drives you in life. Thank you. Uh, you know, Nick, uh, I'm not so sure uh, how much the other three uh, have earned, but I understand that, you know, HD Ong is earns a lot. Eh, <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, HT, uh, do you agree with uh, Nick's uh, uh, view on this? You know, qualifications is, uh, you know, it's vanity, you know, something that is only uh, for people to see. But actually, when you come out in this industry, right, experience is more important. Eh? Well, what I do you think, think? Yeah. Well, I think, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, First and foremost, of course, it all depends on uh, what career path that uh, you, are, you, are, you are going into. Uh, if you are going into business... 
HD, we are losing you. Can you hear me? Yep, uh, it's breaking yeah. up, but you can continue. Okay, I'll, I'll try to switch on and afterwards another, another, another uh, what do you call that, uh, connection. But uh, it depends on the, 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 the choice of career path. If you, are, if you are on the business side, like a contractor, subcontractor, you don't need that string of title. Academician, you need a, a, a PhD to be a professor. And uh, if you want to be a consultant, you, you, you need to be uh, at least uh, having a professional qualification. But if you are going into the area of expert, uh, 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 expert, uh, what do you call that, uh, weakness, then of course that uh, title is important. And uh, it does give uh, the clients uh, the impression at least that uh, you are qualified for the job. All right, uh, HD, you know, I, when I look at the list uh, of names with the accolades that you all have attained, uh, it appears that uh, Severe Dr. Esan has got the uh, most uh, academic qualifications so far. You know, Dr. Esan, you have heard HD Ong, right? You know, you're talking about contractors and developers, maybe they do not need uh, so much qualifications. Uh, if, uh, you are not an academician, so that's why you do not need so many qualifications. Eh? But then if you look at it, if you are only teaching in a university with all these kind of qualifications that you have attained, all you know is only about theory. You know, you have no on-site experience. How are you going to relay a true and accurate message or education to your students without those actual experience? So what do you think about this, uh, Dr. Esan? I think there is a very, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Lam, there is a very uh, interesting question. Uh, it depends on the program that you teach. You see, if you teach uh, in a professional program like quantity surveying, I think it, is, it goes without saying that you must have professional experience as well. Otherwise, students can challenge you, can argue you, can, uh, uh, they, they may not treat you well because of, of, because of your lack of professional experience they may think that you do not know what you guys are talking about so that's why uh, although i am also in academia i've been in academia for the past uh, 14 15 years now uh, both either on a full-time basis now on a part-time basis i i have the confidence to meet my students to discuss with them uh, on topics which are pertinent to the construction industry when i have the necessary uh, experience. So basically, uh, when I was teaching at UM, I had two years of construction experience. So I, I struggled, to be perfectly honest with you, because when my students asked practical questions and I thought I was not doing them a, a huge favor by giving them just theoretical knowledge, you see. So that's why I decided to rejoin industry in 2012 and my teaching has been predominantly based on uh, on my experience working in the industry and from the feedback that i've got from my students i think that they, they find my approach my dual approach of combining theory and practice uh, is useful uh, when comparing uh, practices approaches uh, in both academia and industry thank you mr lamet yeah oh thanks uh Esan, I'm sure you know uh, a lecturer who has both the academic qualifications and experience 15. would have uh, be. I mean, if is in a, a better position to deliver a more accurate uh, information about what's the trend uh, in the market that's related to the uh, view of or subject, and uh, students will be able to appreciate it more, uh, particularly in relation to professional subjects. Now, uh, Dr. Nasim. You know, I have heard uh, many of your uh, uh, seminars uh, where, where you have been speakers, you know, uh, with looking at qualifications and what you're doing now. I don't even have to ask you any further questions about the difference between experience and also qualifications uh, in that respect. But when it comes to hiring, you know, I just want to ask uh, Dr. Nasim about this. You know, you, do, you, you at the first interview, you will not be able to... Uh, uh, know uh, what is the character of that person, you will not be able to know, uh, you know uh, the true experience that he has actually acquired. Maybe he will tell you that, oh, I have a 12 years or 10 years experience in this field, but really, he will not be able to tell whether he had how much uh, experience or knowledge that he has acquired uh, on site 
And what you have on paper uh, is just a statement. And the more uh, reliable or concrete evidence would be the certificates that are presented before you. So what do you think, you know, when it comes to hiring, uh, how are you going to deal with such a situation? Experience, more important, qualification is the determining factor in hiring a person? Okay. Um, I, I would suggest there are three things that uh, anyone hiring would be looking at, whether hiring for industry or hiring for academia. The three things are um, qualifications, what's on paper. Now, the second would be uh, actual experience, industry experience. And the third, which um, arguably is potentially the most important, and that is attitude. Now, employers again and again, they say, if you, if you don't have the skills, we can train you, especially if you're early career. So, but if you have a lousy attitude, no matter how many years of experience you have, you're useless. So attitude, I would suggest, uh, is what's going to determine your aptitude, basically your aptitude eventually. So the other two is the, um, the piece of paper and academic credentials and professional credentials. That is what gets you through the door. I can share with you what happened in, uh, uh, in the UK, for instance. I was working in the UK, there was a recession, and I was looking for a job from industry, I applied to, to Leeds, Leeds Packard University as it's called now. I wouldn't even have got in had it not been for my academic credentials. Uh, the fact that I had a few years of experience then, that helped. Fast forward 10 years ago in 2010, I applied for a job here in New Zealand. I, I didn't have a PhD and yet they took me on because of my 20 years of industry experience. So in other words, they accepted my two masters uh, and halfway, half a PhD as equivalent uh, when you combine it with the industry experience as acceptable. Eventually I got my PhD anyway. And then in industry, I was working, I was um, hired by uh, uh, High Point Rendell, which is a listed claims consultancy in the UK, but in Malaysia, uh, as well as Beard Dirk. Uh, I don't think my CV would have uh, featured highly if I had a whole 20, yeah, by that time about 15, 20 years of experience or so. I don't think they'd have looked at me had it not been for the academic credentials and the professional credentials as well. So what I say is a balance of both. I've had 20 years of industry experience, 10 years of acad academic experience, maybe another 10 years and um, I might think of retiring. I see, all right. Now, back to you, Nick. You know, you have heard all of them, right? Especially Dr. Nassim. You know, what you were saying is that experience is more important, you know, it will help you to uh, uh, earn more money, perhaps, you know, uh, compared uh, to someone who has got a lot of uh, academic uh, credentials. No, the, of course, attitude and aptitude, like Dr. Nassim uh, has said, is important. Now, at the end of the day, when it comes to a uh, newbies, uh, who, who is trying to enter the profession, getting the best or ideal job that they want or the dream job they want to uh, enter into. Now, academic qualification would, would still be uh, the most determining factor, isn't it? You will not be able to gain the necessary experience if you have not gotten into the right place or the right, in, uh, the right company with the necessary academic credentials. So what, do you, what, what do you have to, uh, got to say about it, uh, you know, uh, Nick? I think that um, it's very important to understand uh, someone's ability and experience uh, when they do join a company and that it's not just the fact that they've got the qualification that means that they should go in at a certain level. It should be, there should be a blend, um, which the pan other panelists have alluded to between experience and qualifications. But for example, I've worked with people in the past who have been um, PE teachers for most of their adult life. Then they decided they wanted a change of career. So they taught themselves primavera. They then managed to secure a job actually without qualifications as a forensic de delay analysis. And to be perfectly honest, they have never been on a construction site. They just understand how to use software, which if you put rubbish in, you get rubbish out. So unfortunately, I think our industry is appealing to people because of, you know, it does pay well. Obviously people have to work hard, but I think it is a good paying industry and is appealing to people. Um, 
but unfortunately this gets people that aren't necessarily trained but because they've got a degree command um high salaries and expect to go in at a level that actually their experience doesn't warrant that level um and i think it creates more disputes in the long term because of not having that relevant experience and just to further talk about experience in terms of um an expert can doesn't necessarily have to be qualified because an expert may be needed who is for example a bricklayer or a joiner and in terms of their experience you know somebody that's been on the tools for 20 years um, is invaluable to potentially a tribunal so we don't necessarily need somebody with a lot of qualifications to be present in a tribunal and fight a, a cause or a dispute um, so I think that's important thank you uh, Dr. Ezan, uh, are you there? Yes, I'm still there. Yeah, I'm still okay, wrong. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm referring to your answer earlier, uh, to Lam's answer uh, question. Uh, you said without the professional qualifications, uh, you will not have the confidence to face your students. Uh, that was at the earlier stage. So you have obtained the experience now. Do you think the professional qualifications and the credential are still relevant or required? I think, yeah, professional qualifications are, are very, very relevant. Uh, I, I am a proponent of a blend of both worlds. I, I would like to have both. I would like to have professional qualifications plus experience uh, because this would set you apart from, from, from your peers. I think if you, if you look at my qualifications, uh, I've got seven degrees. Four of them I did while working full-time as a consultant. So you can gain professional experience or professional qualifications while gaining experience at the same time as well. So by having all these professional qualifications, they can validate your experience that you got the right quality experience, which equates to expertise. And with this expertise, you can market yourself either as a professional or a or as an academic, and you can uh, basically convince the people. Uh, in my case, my students that you you know what you guys are, that you know that what I'm talking about. So that is why I value my professional qualifications. And in in my case, I I am pursuing both, and I'm still pursuing my qualifications. To be fairly honest with you, but I'm not at liberty to tell you what I'm doing right now. But it will be revealed in the future. Yeah. Uh, okay, from the uh, practical perspective, uh, even we take away all the qualifications and the credential, uh, it would still be Dr. Ezan as you are, right? Your students or even your clients, they, will, they are not going to get anything lesser in terms of quality. Yeah. Am I right to say? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think you have. So it would, be, it would be the same if. Uh, Ehsan, without the doctor, without the SR, without the uh, line of uh, qualifications, what, what, what do you think about that? I think, I think you, you are right, I think, uh, but I need this to uh, convince myself that I've got the, night, the, the right expertise. So without the right expertise, I don't think I can, uh, I, can, I can market myself to prospective employers out there, what I'm capable of. I need all these professional qualifications to validate my, my experience and, and, and my expertise. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ezan. HT Ong. Yes. Are, are you there? Yep, yep. Yeah, uh, so uh, I would like to ask you the same questions. If uh, we take away all your credentials and qualifications today, uh, would we still get the same HT Ong or a lesser one? Well, I think uh, uh, what it is is that uh, the professional qualification is built over time. And that goes along with your experience and that goes along with, uh, as you, uh, in the industry, the industry recognize you. Once the industry already recognize you, then whatever qualification that is taken away, it doesn't matter anymore because that's you, right? But as you go along, you need to have those uh, credentials behind you. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, uh, people wouldn't know uh, who you are. So if you, if you are, uh, don't have that reputation, then you'll need that credential behind you for people to recognize that. 
Okay. Fair enough. Uh, Dr. Nassim, what, what have you got to say about this? Yeah. I okay. always know you as Dr. Nassim. I actually, I didn't know uh, all of these credentials until it was put up uh, on the screen today. Well, uh, Honke, you know me, right? I've told you many, yes. many times, uh, maybe in a formal session is fine, but just call me Nassim, right? Okay. Now, <laughs> my, my, my thoughts are this. You see, in New Zealand now, all my students call me Nassim. That's it. That's the way it is. In the UK, they used to call me Nassim. Uh, nobody calls me Dr. Nassim. My colleagues don't call me that. Industry people don't call me that. My students don't call me that. But in the context of a Malaysian environment, for instance, um, in, in certain environments, certainly ed education, for instance, uh, of course, they call me professor. Students from China, uh, they call me professor. I'm not a full professor. I'm only an associate professor. They call me professor. So do students from India. So it's a question of looking at it in context and, and different environments and so on. So the students are uncomfortable not calling you professor or, or doctor and so on. Uh, so it, it, it's a question of uh, adjusting ourselves to uh, different societies. We'll come back to your question. So without all these credentials, who am I? Uh, I said earlier, I think in the end, what matters is uh, attitude. I am just me, Nassim. And the reason why I'm Dr. Nassim or past president, surveyor Dr. Nassim or whatever, is uh, the context. Now, I'll admit one thing to you in front of everyone, that SR designation surveyor is something that I initiated when I was in Malaysia, was it about 15 years ago or something? Yeah, more than 15 years ago. Why did I do that? It's not for vanity at all. I found, and this is what triggered me, I attended one of my children's uh, school, I can't remember, Street Chihaya somewhere, and they were saying, oh, engineer something, doctor something, you know, medical doctor. And I thought, nobody knows what quantity surveyors are. So that's where I thought, why do we initiate this SR? Everybody will be asking, what is SR? And now the architects followed, AR. Perhaps Wailun could initiate LR for lawyers. I don't know. Oh, please, Maybe. Don't, please don't. Yeah, yeah. it sounds higher. <laughs> oh, okay, fair enough. But, but it's not a vanity thing. I did it genuinely to promote the surveying profession. Okay? It's not about vanity. Yeah. You know, Dr. Uh, Dr. Nassim, you know, uh, talking about the, uh, uh, the title uh, uh, before your name, like the surveyor is SR and the uh, architect is AR. You know, I've actually heard about a story about you know, what, what is the title is going to give uh, to the lawyers. Of course, it's not LR. That was uh, outright rejected because uh, LR sounds like a liar. <laughs> no, but the thing is that, that there have been another recommendation. You know, we have been called in Malaysia as advocates and solicitors. In short, the acronym would be AS. And someone then suggested to add another S to it. <laughs> and it made it a perfect uh, you know, title for lawyers uh, before their names. Now, I think it's uh, for lawyers... Uh, it's better off not to have any title at all. <laughs> and we are happy to remain as is. <laughs> we want to uh, move on. There is actually a question from the audience. You know? uh, they wanted to know what actually drives you to, uh, to, to, ga to gain so many uh, qualifications. Uh, you know, if you are already a doctor, one subject is meet, made a doctor, and that would be sufficient. You know, you are a doctor, and people would be able to know that you are very uh, well qualified academically. Why do you continue to gain more and more and more of our I other pro professional qualifications? Actually, what drive you to, uh, to to getting those uh, qualifications in the first place? Why don't I ask uh, 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 Doctor Esan because you have the longer li longest list of uh, credentials academically. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Lam. I think what drives me, what motivates me, I think, uh, in my case, I, I come from a humble background. I think my, my father was, was a, a lorry driver in one of uh, the most deprived states in Malaysia, earning 500 ringgit a month. So uh, when I was growing up, I think he, he asked me, he, he wanted to borrow money from me because of uh, his uh, financial problems. So I, I got some money through a scholarship that I got from, uh, from the government. So I, I, I lent him the money. So I, I got the wake up call at that time. If, if, if I don't work hard, I, 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 I would end up like my father. But, but don't blame my father. My father was a victim of circumstance. He did not have access to education. His uh, mother died at the age of 20 when he was two. 
So and uh, after the after that moment of epiphany, I I I decided to to see how far I can go, and I've been collecting all these titles for the past years of my life now, and I'm still pursuing a, a, a few of them as as, as we speak. Uh, this is just for my personal uh, achievement. I, I I would like to prove to myself and my four children. Uh, that a kampung boy can uh, achieve uh, whatever he sets to achieve if he puts his soul, mind, intellect into it. So, so this is just my personal uh, motivation, Mr. Lam. Yeah. Dr. Esan, you know, looking at your credentials and your achievements, I'm sure you are already an inspiration for your family. And your, Thank you. Yeah. So, how about, uh, uh, you know, Nick, I'm not going to ask you this question because uh, it is very obvious, all right? So you stay there and uh, just listen to the other three panel panelists. Uh, how about H T Ong? What What do you think about that? You know, what What drives you uh, to getting those uh, academic qualifications? Uh, well, first and foremost, the academic uh, the the well, you mentioned about academic first. Uh, the academic qualification was when I was uh, in UK uh, and uh, I first got my bachelor degree. Asia and we were having a recession so I continue working down in London and that's where when you have three years there doing your RICS uh, TPC and getting your professional qualification as uh, as uh, uh, a QS uh, at that time I had got two paths one is to do my PhD and end up like uh, Dr. Nassim uh, or Dr. Asant or go into the professional field and uh, I, I consulted my uh, my uh, lecturer who advised me that, what do you want to become? So I say, I want to become a professional. And that's how I ended up in London. And that's where, when you have the time, I did my MSc, I did my MBA, and also other uh, professional qualification. And as you go along, and it's a career progression, as you go along after my RICS, I came back, I decided that uh, I want to uh, get into the field of uh, arbitration, ADR, so I got my CIR qualification. And uh, when I left Singapore and uh, joined, I decided then that the CIOB is important. So you can see it's just a progression. And over the years, you can see that you pick up the qualification along the line. And when I was doing a lot of work on civil engineering, I, and I thought uh, that uh, uh, my Hong Kong office said that, why don't you join the Chartered Institute of Civil Engineering Surveyor? So I become a civil engineering surveyor uh, as well. So you go along and, 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 and you, you, you have your professional qualification because of the relevance uh, to your career. And I don't, I don't mind saying to you that the next one that is relevant to me will perhaps be Expert Witness Institute. Right? Thank you, All Mr. Right, uh, yeah, uh, thank you, HT. Now, uh, it has actually uh, uh, come to the end of the session because we have utilized the 30 minutes, you know, for all of you, we have so much to share, you know, the time is just too short. But, uh, you know, before we part, uh, we, I, I'm just going to ask you one uh, thing from, from, from uh, each of you. Now, it's, let's start with Nick. Now, at this moment, we are actually going through trying times. We have COVID-19, the industry is badly hit. And it's going to take some time for us to rise back again. And uh, there are a lot of uh, fresh graduates uh, coming out uh, who are you know, wishing to join the industry or who are eager to join the industry. And they have so many dreams, you know, as a young, fresh graduate that you uh, actually wanted to and look forward to achieving more in your career path. Now, what do you, what do you have got to say for this uh, young, expiring uh, Freshies who are looking forward to joining the construction industry. Um, well, I actually started off my career. Um, so, like uh, Dr. Essan uh, alluded to, I studied for one of my for my sole degree um, part time, and it took me five years. So, by the time I'd come out of university, I'd already got four years' experience. Um, now, not everybody uh, takes that path, but what I would say is carefully cho choose your employer and don't just choose them based necessarily on money 
look at what the potential for growth is, what your attitude and appetite is for, and think about what you want to achieve in, say, 10 years' time. Don't just take the first job because it's the first job offered to you. Make sure it's the right job if you want to focus on experience. The biggest companies aren't necessarily always the best because you can become a number, so you get lost. So sometimes it's better to join a, an SME where you would get more experience and understand the whole process rather than specializing on something. And then when you understand the whole process, you can focus on what you want, which way you want to go later on in the process. Now that's something which I did and that, that's worked out well for me. Um, but I think in all of this, it's important to remember that it's what you want to do as an individual. And there's no right or wrong answer in this. Thank you, uh, Nick. Dr. Nassim, what have you got to say for, for this aspiring uh, people, you know, female, male, and others who are looking forward to joining the construction industry? Okay. I, what I would advise is this. Don't do multiple degrees. Don't get multiple professional qualifications. Except if it's going to benefit you and it's going to be useful for you. I did the master's in King's College. I found it extraordinarily useful. I won't be in the, in, in the industry relating to construction law had it not been for that. A structured program over you know, the, the whole year and so on. So don't do it for the sake of uh, picking up qualifications. Do it for what it's going to give you. I picked up RICS. I'm a quantity surveyor. I wanted to be recognized internationally. I was working in the UK. So of course, chartered quantity surveyor is something that I aspire to. I'm now a member of the NZIQS, New Zealand Surveyor Quantity Surveyors, because I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm a council member and so on. So uh, do something that's going to benefit you and is going to be useful for you. And then at one point, I saw, oh, CIOB. I was working in project management. And they are the ones who published the code of practice for project management it's going to benefit you and to service your clients well. So don't just pick up qualifications for the sake of it. Pick up the relevant ones that's going to benefit you and the society that you're serving. That's my advice. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nassim. How about uh, H. Diong? What do you have got to say? Well, uh, I've always told all these uh, young uh, graduates that uh, more importantly is what is your career direction? Where are you heading? And uh, you need to plan and you need to make sure that uh, you know what you do. And sometimes you can say that, oh, you want to do certain things, but life is such that it may not work out the way you want to. Like, for example, uh, I did my MBA thinking that I can get out of the construction industry and go into management <laughs> consultancy. But uh, the, the, the more I, 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 I go through it, I found out that eventually it became very useful for me when other uh, business as well. So I think uh, for those uh, young, uh, what do you call that, uh, undergraduate, uh, know where you are heading. And if you want to become a QS, uh, registered QS, then go through the process, go through and be, be trained in a consultancy firm uh, uh, before you venture out into uh, other, other, other companies. Thank you, uh, HD. You know, Dr. Esan, uh, have, uh, having heard you uh, just now about your uh, how you actually grew up and how you actually uh, attained your uh, qualifications and of course achieved so much now. I felt a little bit touched. I'm sure a lot of uh, audience would uh, felt the same way as well. Um, before we part, you know, could Aisan give some words of encouragement to these uh, people who uh, are aspiring to joining the construction industry, the young and freshies? Hey, to all young surveyors out there, I think you've got the luxury of young age, you see. Uh, you've got the whole world in front of you, you see. So use your time properly. Uh, of, of course, uh, your education, your formal education in quantity surveying, in engineering, whatever is important. Uh, but also, you should also gain other important soft skills, uh, which are industrial relevant, like communication skills, uh, language skills as well, and 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 we and then you should take this opportunity. Uh, we got this uh, uh, MCO order and 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 such. Uh, you you got the luxury of or, or the opportunity 
to stay at home to to do something useful with your time rather than you know watching movies on YouTube uh, wasting time why don't you enroll uh, in online <laughs> courses at I know Harvard at Harvard for example they offer free online courses for you to do in negotiation in communic uh, in uh, improving your communication skills so on and so forth use your time properly because what why what if if the thing is that why don't you give your best now why why work your ass off for three years of your life to determine your future 30 years down the road from now so i think that is a fair deal just give these three years your best possible shot gaining all the skills and experience uh, and knowledge that will set you for life i i, I see no harm in doing that so i, I would suggest you to to use your time properly and think where you see yourself uh, in the short run and in the long run and, and make plan accordingly. Uh, and of course, change your plan as well as you go along because we are dynamic and, and, and circumstances change and warrant us to, to, to improve, uh, to, to, to change our plan. But have a goal, have a set of goals and have a set of plans how to achieve those goals and make changes accordingly and, and, and use your time to, to, to your benefit. Thank you, Mr. Lam. Thank you, Dr. Ensan. I have to close this session immediately because I have to log on to a uh, Harvard uh, website now to <laughs> sign up the free. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks to uh, all our professionals for appearing today. Uh, very interesting discussions. Uh, they are the people that uh, we want to talk to and seek advice to, to develop our career. I think professional qualification uh, will improve our marketability and open up new doors of opportunities. Uh, but we still have to, just like Dr. Ensign said, we still have to continue our dedication uh, to self-improvement and finally the industry or the market uh, will acknowledge us. Okay, uh, thank you all. And it's Sunday tomorrow uh, and in our experience from the past two weeks, uh, it tells us that the turn up uh, tend to be lower during the weekend. Uh, but tomorrow is a special session. Tomorrow we will have uh, Roland Collins, the president of Lighthouse Club KL. Ronan uh, will share with us the several charity programs uh, they have initiated during the COVID-19 outbreak. And, and then there's more than that. Uh, Ronan promises to donate uh, 500 ringgit if the audience uh, reaches 650. And to make things even more interesting, uh, Suyim and Daniel Alcon will each match uh, that if the number reaches 688. So uh, guys, you all know what to do. It's for great cause and your support is appreciated. Uh, thank you, everyone. So see you tomorrow morning. Uh, thank you, professionals. Nick, Esan, uh, Dr. Lasim, and HDR. Uh, thank you, Wailun. Thank you. Thank you, thank you uh, to all the Stay panelists. Stay safe, everybody. Stay home. Stay safe. Take care. Stay safe. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.